um, there's emissions, uh, uh, sorry, burn fossil fuels, there are uh, emissions of air pollutants and greenhouse gases, mainly CO2, and as well as uh, wastewaters. Uh, in particular, in, in Texas, we do a lot of hydraulic uh, fracking that also produce uh, wastewater as well. Um, not many people maybe know that, um, but uh, today, I'm, uh, uh, so I'm developing technology for both uh, CO2 and, and water uh, uh, treatment. Today, I'm going to focus on uh, the CO2 capture and conversion. Uh, and I will introduce the three approaches that I have uh, uh, you know, worked on, as listed in the title of my talk. Uh, the photocatalytic conversion process first, uh, I, I conducted at room temperature uh, or near room temperature, um, uh, re reducing CO2 with water with uh, low intensity sunlight. Right? And then the second uh, to uh, topic is the photothermochemical um, process, let me get this annotation. And uh, this is conducted under uh, you know, it's concentrated solar condition at uh, high temperature. The third one is uh, which I recently uh, uh, worked is the electrochemical reduction of uh, CO2. Um, hopefully then using uh, solar electricity due to this uh, current uh, recent uh, dramatic drop of uh, uh, solar PV. And then I think this uh, electrochemical approach is becoming uh, more and more promising. So today I'm going to briefly introduce three of them one by one. Hopefully I can um, have time to do that. Please bear with me if I, I, I speak fast on some of these uh, uh, slides. Um, so at the end, I hope to give a summary of these uh, three and then have a comparison of their pros and cons and give my personal pers pers perspectives uh, of this over or the field of CO CO2 uh, conversion. All right, let's see. First is, um, let's uh, photocatalysis approach. Right? So actually, Mother Nature is doing this uh, um, has been and, and been doing this uh, a good job for a long time, right? and we know that fossil fuels actually you know come from this uh, photosynthesis. However, uh, we humans uh, are right consuming fossil fuels um, at a must uh, faster speed than the mother nature can provide us. Okay, so since uh, uh, 1970s, people uh, have um, you know, developed this uh, so-called artificial photosynthesis approach uh, to produce solar fuels from sunlight. Um, for example, here the heterogeneous, uh, using uh, heterogeneous catalysis, uh, um, uh, semiconductor nanocrystals like uh, TiO2. Uh, so under uh, photoillumination, uh, if the TiO2 absorb uh, photon energy greater than its band gap, then uh, electron holes will be produced and electrons go and reduce uh, uh, you know, water into hydrogen or if there is CO2, you can reduce CO2 into these uh, various products. Uh, meanwhile, the holes can oxidize water into oxygen. It sounds like a very appealing uh, um, uh, idea. However, there are uh, several scientific challenges. Uh, first of all, the choice of catalyst. Right? Uh, as of now, um, even though uh, you know, several decades has, has passed since the first uh, um, you know, research, there is still no winner of a, a single semiconductor that can um, have the appropriate band gap, namely narrow enough to absorb a good portion of sunlight, and then the appropriate band, band edges that can you know, power both the reduction and oxidation uh, uh, reactions. Right? And secondly is the fast electron um, hole recombinations either happening on, in the bulk or on the surface. So that leads, uh, leads to a low yield, um, typically in the micromole per gram range, and then that means there's a long way uh, before uh, commercialization. Of course, other challenges include instabilities and the uh, toxicity and abundancy of the material and uh, the product selectivity. So TO2 is believed to be uh, you know, a, a very a suitable uh, or I don't say widely uh, extensively studied because it's abundant, cheap, stable, and non-toxic. But the main drawback is it's, it's large band gap. So it only absorbs uh, UV light. Um, so in the past about uh, 13 years, uh, I have worked on this uh, photocatalysis uh, for CO2 reduction uh, and working with TiO2 based cat uh, catalyst. 
by doing a lot of engineering approaches, uh, right, to modify TO2 or forming some TO2 nanocomposites, hopefully to overcome the above mentioned uh, limitations. Um, so here are those uh, listed those uh, approaches I've used. Many of those now uh, become uh, well known and well practiced. But today I hope to introduce something maybe that's not so common and I think it's interesting. Um, this, uh, this concept, I call it integrated uh, CO2 capture and photocatalytic conversion and operate at a room, uh, sorry, a flue gas temperature. So actually this was the, the main idea of my career, NSF career project. Uh, in the meantime, I would also like to introduce a couple of very useful in situ spectroscopy uh, analysis uh, tools um, for mechanistic study. This include in situ FTIR and uh, in situ X-ray absorption spectroscopy. All right, so now uh, if you're in the uh, committee, uh, community of uh, CO2 capture and conversion, and uh, you probably know that this field is probably uh, divided by two main areas. One is for capture and one is for conversion. And there are not many overlap in between each other. When we do conversion, we typically use, of course, in the lab scale, we use a pure CO2, right, from a gas cylinder. But uh, if we want to do this uh, in a, a large scale uh, for commercialization, then the more economical way is to directly convert CO2 uh, emissions from, um, say, power plant flue gas, you know, without the need to concentrate in uh, CO2. Because otherwise, uh, when you do CO2 conversion, you have to uh, include the cost of capture. Right? Uh, so then if we examine the, the for example, coal-fired power plant flue gas composition, we can see they're both CO2 and water uh, uh, exists there, uh, which is good. There, those are the reactants. Um, and there are some, some other minor or, or, uh, gases. And also interesting is you can see here is the temperature is above 100 degrees Celsius. Right. And um, so then my thought was, can we integrate this CO2 capture and photocatalytic conversion process by designing this one hybrid material with the uh, drawbone and the photocatalysis uh, uh, components together, and then tune this uh, uh, catalyst so that it can operate at uh, power plant flue gas condition. So by doing that, then you don't have to cool down the flue gas for CO2 capture, which is typically required if you use a mean based uh, sorbent. And um, so no temperature will help uh, adsorption. Um, secondly, there's you don't need. Uh, you don't waste the thermal energy from sunlight. And again, conventionally, this photocatalysis was conducted at um, room temperature or near room temperature. Right? So by shining a sunlight, you use the UV portion, but you discard the IR part. And then, then on the other hand, I have to cool it. So that's extra cost. So if you can run at this high temperature, um, higher temperature, and using sunlight, that's, that's a perfect, perfect match. So lastly is by uh, operating at a higher temperature, then we can promote the product desorption, which sometimes is actually a, a, a limiting factor right, for these, these reactions. All right, so with that in mind, we have developed this hybrid magnesium aluminum layer double, high, uh, double oxide material with the titanium dioxide in nanocrystals embedded in between these uh, interlayers. Um, so this uh, layer double oxide is derived from uh, uh, you know, layer double hydroxide materials um, and after calcination it just uh, they become um, oxides and then the, it turns out it has a, a good adsorption capacity at moderate temperature. So you can see these are the TEM images, these are the, the layer structure with TO2 crystals you know, uh, embedded in the layers and then interestingly here if you look at the, the BET analysis this hybrid material with 43% of uh, the titanium dioxide exhibit a dramatically you know, higher uh, surface area than the individual components right, of them. So that means uh, because of uh, put, you know, putting them together, it increased, uh, induced a lot of these uh, small pores, so the surface area increased. And then here the TGA, uh, you know, uh, uh, dropshing isotherm tells us uh, with the, high, the hybrid material also, you know, has much higher uh, CO2 uptake capacity, right, than the individual uh, components. Okay, that's clearly see the synergy of this, uh, you know, adsorption. 
So now let's see how we do this process for the integrated capture and conversion. Okay, again, unlike conventional photocatalysis, which you shine the, the light, right, on the, the, in the photoreactor continuously, right, then you produce a product continuously. Here, what we do is we first uh, use, uh, do this in a dark condition, do a dropping, right, for CO2 and water vapor um, at 150 degrees C, which is full gas uh, temperature. And then after some time, we just cut off CO2, and then we eliminate uh, uh, the sunlight. And in the meantime, we can untune the temperature. So for example, we slightly increase temperature to 200 C. So you can see in that case, it's, it's similar to a you know, temperature, temperature uh, swim, uh, uh, right, adsorption, desorption process. So you can expect that uh, part of the, the CO2 is de-drogged you know, from the material. And because in the meantime, we have uh, you know, photo illumination, and then CO, some of the, the products, uh, major product is CO, can be you know, produced from these uh, right, dropped uh, CO2 species. And ideally, this uh, material is automatically regenerated, right? and then we can go through this process, dark light, dark light process again, uh, cycle over cycle. So, so before I show you the results here, I just want to introduce this uh, in situ uh, diffuse reflectance uh, FTIR uh, called DRIFTS um, uh, study. So this uh, uh, DRIFTS cell, the un uniqueness of this cell is it has a quartz window that can allow uh, you know, photo illumination. And meanwhile, this cell uh, can be operated at a, a, a designated temperature, and then you can introduce your reaction and gas in and out of this cell. So on the right hand side, you can see the, the IR spectrum of this, uh, you know, three passes. Uh, one, the first one is uh, adoption right? in the dark. You can see a lot of these uh, various uh, carbonate, bicarbonate species form. And then we right, switch CO2 into the helium. Um, then what do you expect? And also just increase temperature to 200. You expect, you can see that uh, a part of the dropped species are desorbed. And then it reached um, actually an equilibrium. And then we keep the same temperature, but we just turn on the light right, for some time. And then you can see these carbonate species are further are, you know, reduced, which means this, uh, because they operate, you know, those two, two and three are at the same temperature. So that means the UV um, radiation actually right, helps the desorption or you know, some chemical reactions happening on the surface to convert carbonate species into CO. And uh, so we quantified the this amount of desorption and per, uh, CO produced, um, and then we do, did uh, cycle uh, experiments. And here shows data for five cycles. If the total job is 100, right, and you see for the desorption, 80% 80, 80 of these uh, adopt species are desorbed during that process, and then 50% is converted into CO and then about 5% is still you know, on the surface as a residual. Um, so considering the 15% is actually quite uh, a dramatic number because uh, considering the, the huge amount of uh, CO2 emitted from uh, power plants, if we can really convert 15% of those uh, into, into CO, that's, that's, that would be very uh, uh, interesting and very, very, very promising, right? So, but you can see one limitation here is after uh, five cycles, um, the desorption capacity probably maintained the same, but uh, the CO conversion decreased a bit and the residuals increased, which means after high cycle after cycle, uh, it's kind of uh, deactivating a little bit. So at one time, then we need to fully regenerate the material at a higher temperature after some cycles because the 200 C is just mild. So you might need to say 400 C to fully regenerate to, right, to desorb those residuals. But that's not the most, uh, the major limitation, but I think the major problem is the kinetics, this ma mismatch between these uh, photo conversion versus adoption or desorption. So the photo conversion is, the pretty slow process, right, takes uh, um, a longer time than the desorption uh, or adsorption desorption process. So, which means if in a, in a full scale application, you might need to, you know, build a, a larger volume of reactor for photo 
uh, reaction. So that, that kind of uh, uh, limit the uh, commercialization potential. Um, but nevertheless, I think that's a relatively new concept uh, that we have developed. Um, okay, now I want to uh, switch uh, gear a little bit on this uh, in situ drifts, uh, sorry, in situ X ray absorption spectroscopy is set up. I, I think this uh, XAS is a very useful tool to, to study the st structure or property, uh, property performance relationships, right? Um, but uh, in situ, photocatalysis um, study is, uh, was rarely done. So our contribution is to design this type of cell. You can eliminate the UV and then meanwhile with the X-ray, you can so discover the change of, uh, for example, in this case, the copper, C, uh, copper TL to catalyst. Uh, we can see the change of copper valence if we begin with uh, uh, copper two plus, uh, to begin with this photo reduction process, it doesn't change uh, the valence, right? But if we begin with copper one, a reduced copper species, the valence actually, uh, uh, the, the population of copper one decreased. Um, but if we introduce whole scavenger, then the population of copper one is maintained or even increased, okay? And so of course, here's a, a X of uh, analysis indicating this uh, single you know, single bond of uh, copper oxygen. Um, all right, so do some uh, we did some X of feeding and then which matched the lens analysis, uh, and then also some quantification is done here and then correlated with uh, this catalytic activity. Copper two plus is stable, but it's not reactive. Okay, copper one plus is is more reactive, but it, ox it is oxidized to two, uh, two plus by likely the photo-induced holes. So that's why this, this material is not stable, okay? But then if we introduce hole scavengers, copper one plus is stable and then it reaches the highest uh, you know, catalytic activity. So that's, I just want to you know, give this example of how this in situ XAS can do a very, uh, be a very powerful tool to correlate Right, the, the structure performance uh, relations. All right, so let's see, uh, move on to the uh, second topic is the photothermal uh, chemical CO2 reforming of methane. Uh, I think currently uh, industrialized process is called the steam reforming of methane to produce uh, syngas or, or hydrogen, right? Um, and most of our, our hydrogen actually is produced uh, from steam reforming. The benefit of doing CO2 reforming, or we call it dry reforming, is because you can fix more carbon, right? So that lowers the carbon footprint. Um, so again, it shares uh, the same, um, you know, pro uh, uh, property like uh, endothermic reaction. So it needs high temperature, right? And also there's a side, uh, side reaction, a like gas uh, a reverse uh, water gas shift. And also they cited uh, reaction of methane decomposition and uh, boulder reaction can cause a coke deposition on the surface so that the catalyst deactivates. This is the main reason, uh, deactivation is the main reason that this dry reforming is not commercialized yet as compared to the steam reforming. Um, okay, so since I've been doing photocatalysis right, for a long time, I'm thinking, oh, can we? You know, take advantage of this photocatalysis and uh, incorporate that into the thermal catalysis, in this case at high temperature. The reason is because people have used uh, uh, solar energy to do this, hydrogen solar. However, they just uh, use solar as the pure heat source, right, when, when they do the concentrated solar. Um, then use conventional catalyst. So if I want to uh, try to get a synergy of photocatalysis, I need to use a, a semiconductor as my support. So I chose uh, cerium oxide, right, as a support. Uh, it's a photo uh, catalyst with a band gap around uh, 2.8 uh, eV. And then of course, TT is the thermal catalysis for methane decomposition. And meanwhile, it's a co-catalyst for thermal catalysis. And then of course, I include, include some promoters there. And this one also interesting, the AOD, uh, atomic layer deposition um, of a surface coating of magnesium oxide. Um, you can see after coating a very thin layer, 
of a magnesium oxide. You can see uh, the photo uh, photoluminescence spectrum, you know, is uh, dramatically decreased, which means it can reduce the surface recombination. Um, so here's a, a setup when, uh, when we do uh, the experiments and we use the uh, concentrated solar simulator, which can go up to 30 suns of illumination. So here's how the reactor uh, look like. Uh, have the, the solar radiation about one, one inch square on this uh, catalyst surface. And we use the uh, tube furnace uh, as uh, auxiliary uh, heating um, source if we need at a higher temperature because solar itself can only reach about 500 C. So at higher temperature, we need more uh, thermal from the tube furnace. Of course, as a control, we can we turn off the light and only heat up the, the reactor uh, by tube furnace. Okay, here's some activity uh, data uh, for uh, the production of uh, hydrogen and CO from this uh, PTC uh, uh, dry reforming. Um, so you can see these uh, are starting markers are the dark condition, which means only the tube furnace is, is providing the heat, right? The open markers are light, so under concentrated solar. Um, they both are operated at 600 C, the same temperature, because we tune that uh, with the thermocouple, uh, the temperature is controlled. And you can see the dramatic difference here in the dark, activity is very low, and then it deactivates regardless of this, um, the materials, right? But with light illumination, you can see it's quite stable. And then by adding some you know, zinc promoter, and then it's more active, by coating uh, just a five layer or AOD layer of magnesium oxide, it's even it's much more uh, active. All right. So you can see actually uh, here this graph shows you we tune the, the the number of AOD cycles or the thickness of the, the uh, over layer. One cycle is you know one atomic layer. It's uh, less than one angstrom. So so five layer actually is less than 0.5 nanometers. So it's sub nanometer, but it has dramatic uh, effect you know, on this activity. You see five layer is about optimum, but uh, a thicker layer, thicker layer actually reduce the activity maybe because um, it um, just uh, inhibit the diffusion right, of the reactants to the catalyst surface and also prohibit the, uh, the charge transfer you know, under this uh, solar. So there is an optimum uh, layer. Um, and also, uh, you know, some people may wonder if you have the, the photo effect or it's truly a photo effect, uh, photocatalysis effect. So we did control experiments using non-semiconductor like silica or alumina as the support. And we don't see that uh, this, firm, uh, this uh, promotion under light illumination. So it's light and dark the same, okay? That's more or less tells you uh, this uh, due to photocatalysis. And also we tried uh, uh, actually TiO2 because it's a semiconductor, but it doesn't work well. It showed a little bit of effect, but not very well. So serum oxide is the best so far we found. I think because of this uh, serum, uh, the oxygen uh, vacancies uh, or the mobilities of uh, you know, oxygen that plays a very important role. So we did a characterization of the serum three plus population, you know, before and after it uh, reaction, right? This is through XPS. So you can see the fresh one is about, you know, 33%. And then if it done old in dark condition, the serum three plus population dropped significantly um, for all these materials, right? And then however, if have under light illumination, the population of serum three plus is maintained, which, correspond very well with the, you know, the stability or the activity, right, of this, uh, the GC measurements, okay. So with that, as I think that's, uh, that demonstrate we have proved the synergy, right, between photo and thermal by probably more effectively, more, more effectively use the full solar spectrum, the UV part uh, or near UV part to, to power the photocatalysis and then the, the longer wavelength part, right, IR including, to power the thermal, and then um, you have an overall you know, higher efficiency. 
So also we have done some uh, temperature or dependence studies uh, with this material. So we tried uh, right from low temperature to high, and uh, then we we found that actually if you draw a horizontal line here to reach the same uh, production rate of you know hydrogen or CO, right? So you can actually save about one, at least 100 degrees C if you operate under light compared to those in the dark. Okay, that's the first uh, observation. And second is um, this photocatalysis effect contribution uh, is more significant at higher temperature uh, rather than you know, at the lower temperature. This is very interesting. So we're still investigating the reason, but I, my hypothesis is here is maybe this photocatalysis promote more on the CO2 dissociation part um, but the CH4, the methane dissociation, because it's mainly driven by the metal catalyst and driven by maybe a higher temperature. So that's why you need a higher temperature to, to dissociate uh, CH4, and then the photo can kick in and then help the right, reaction of the intermediates of the like, CHX with uh, the dissociated CO2. So that's why there's a sort of uh, a threshold for the, the photo to kick in. All right, so this then we to 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 confirm that hypothesis we used this again in situ drifts uh, to study the surface property uh, under real you know reaction conditions. Um, here, of course, we did only in three three hundred because at too higher temperature the spectrum are, are very weak. Okay, so nevertheless, at three hundred you can see the left one, left one is the dark condition, right is the light under light. So in the first few minutes, the spectrum looks similar, but under light, you see after 10 minutes also, the, the CO2 absorption um, peaks uh, you know, are different from that in the dark. And in the meantime, those two peaks, right, linear absorbed CO and uh, gaseous CO uh, are observed, okay, under light only, not in the dark. Okay, so which uh, proves that, uh, you know, this photocatalysis really activates reactants at uh, a lower temperature. Okay, so that's the um, second part. And then now I want to maybe spend the last uh, 10 minutes or so on the third topic, it's uh, uh, electrochemical CO2 uh, conversion and diffuse, as I said, because of the dropping price uh, of the solar or uh, PV or wind energy. So it's becoming more and more economical to use this uh, to, to do the splitting of CO2 in a uh, uh, CO2 electrolyzer. And um, in, in also in my research, of course, I focused on the CO again. Many other research researchers uh, you know, are studying um, you know, formic acid or C2C3 products. Um, I, I work on CO because um, I think it's um, relatively easier uh, thermodynamically, it's not that challenging. It only needs two electrons and easier to separate the CO from the CO2 rather than you need to, if it's a liquid product, if you need to separate the liquid from the electrolyte, it's cost more energy to do that, right? And also, again, it's an important feedstock as uh, part of uh, syngas. So however, also challenges, um, including this slow uh, CO2 reduction kinetics, the different selectivities, Right, uh, which can also the hydrogen evolution reaction compete with uh, CO2 reduction. So for CO, CO2 to CO, uh, I think uh, the Sitavart uh, uh, catalyst is metal, right? Uh, like uh, silver in this case. Uh, uh, you can see this nanoporous uh, silver. Um, also recently, people have used these 2D materials. Um, and I'm interested in carbon. You know, one reason is um, the carbon is earth abundant material. And, um, you know, carbon itself, uh, it's a lower price uh, than metals. Uh, of course, to fabricate those uh, you know, unique uh, carbon structure probably needs some uh, energy intensive process to do that. But hopefully, you know, we can develop a more, you know, you know environmentally benign or low cost process to produce this carbon material. So that's the, the goal I'm, I'm working on. 
right? So again, working on with carbon, we also need to you know, look at these issues of overpotential, the current, the competitive uh, you know, hydrogen revolution. Okay, so to, to address um, these challenges, right, we are uh, focused on, on three parts. One is you know, doing some dopings on this uh, carbon catalyst. Uh, nitrogen is a well-known doping, um, but we're also looking to the other uh, non-metal dopings like phosphorus, sulfur, and fluorine. Um, the second approach is uh, trying to increase the selectivity of CO by developing single atomic metal and nitrogen doped uh, catalyst. And because we found that uh, if you have metal clusters or nanoparticles, it favors uh, you know, hydrogen revolution, but a single atomic uh, this metal or catalyst favors uh, CO production. Okay, so the the so lastly we have engineered also the surface of the the carbon by creating more pores and edges, which we believe are the, the more active sites, and build some hierarchical uh, structures and then using some alternative carbon source, as I said, to lower the price. For example, we used um, right commercial uh, carbon nanotubes as as the carbon source. We always use the petroleum coke waste uh, as the carbon, uh, the carbon source to develop uh, uh, relatively lower cost uh, carbon materials. Um, okay, I, I think here, so first we have uh, examined or screened some of um, these uh, different metals, right, these transition metals and see which one is, you know, performs better. And then um, dump them with the, the nitrogen so typically you form this uh, metal nitrogen uh, bonding. Uh, typically it's metal nitrogen uh, four, okay? Um, so this is through some uh, simple synthesis process to get the graphene-like um, uh, a structure, carbon structure, just through the pyrolysis of some precursor of say citric acid as a carbon source, uh, urea as the um, uh, nitrogen source, and then the metal nitrite uh, as the metal source, just pyrolyze, pyrolyze them at uh, say 900 degrees Celsius, then you can get this, this structure, okay? Then we compared the, the activity in terms of a Faraday efficiency of CO production. Uh, you see this volcano shape, uh, right? So we can reach uh, uh, you know, over 90% um, for on the nickel. So we found by comparing these five metals, uh, we see that, um, so iron and nickel appears to be uh, the winners. Uh, iron has a good, you know, not bad, uh, close to 90% CO selectivity, but the drawback is it, it has um, low turnover uh, frequency or low current. However, the overpotential is, is quite low, right? So that's uh, the drawback of uh, iron. Um, but for nickel, it has a uh, also a good CO selectivity, more than you know, 90%. But the downside is that it requires a little bit larger, you know, over potential. Although the activity is high, right? So there's uh, just different pros and cons for these different metals. But it appears that iron and nickel are are you know more interesting materials to work with. Okay, then. We, uh, in this work, is, uh, we developed this uh, single atomic uh, metal nitrogen uh, carbon catalyst through an you know, interesting uh, approach called uh, using ZIF material as the, the precursor. Uh, this in collaboration uh, with uh, one of our you know, project collaborators. Um, so then we developed this ZIF material and then through carbonization you get a uh, single atomic uh, catalyst. So here this STEM images just show you uh, from the far right, you can see here these, these uh, bright, bright dots indicates the single atomic, uh, either here's iron or here's cobalt. Okay, and then the, the X-ray uh, absorption analysis also tells you, right, the lens gives you the oxidation state and, and then X-offs give you the coordination environment. So you can see this owning a single peak, major peak of this, um, you know, metal nitrogen and bound. There's no metal metal bound, which means uh, though it's a single atomic. Uh, and then it is uh, the quality number between metal and nitrogen is four. So that confirmed it's, uh, it's ion M4 or cobalt M4. Okay, again, comparing the, uh, 
CO2 reduction activity, you know, by evaluating the current and also the Faraday efficiency. Okay, you can see that iron is, uh, is more active than cobalt. Again, that confirms with the, the previous study, uh, but with this different morphology of uh, carbon. Right. So iron can reach 93% selectivity. So despite both iron and cobalt catalysts, they have uh, similar surface area and uh, similar composition. Um, so iron is more active than, than cobalt. Here, this, this figure also show you the long-term stability is, is good, at least for 20, 20 hours. It's uh, stable. Okay. Again, we'll also have some co um, collaborators working on, on the DFT calculations to review right, the catalytic nature of uh, this catalyst. And we found also interesting the uh, uh, edge hosted, you know, uh, metal nitrogen um, carbon species is more right, active uh, than the bulk hosted uh, uh, configuration. And um, so these uh, calculations uh, show you that uh, if you see this table here, the overpotential, onset overpotential for iron right, is, uh, is lower, always lower than the hydrogen evolution. Okay? But, and then for this edge hosted N2 plus 2, it's, it's even lower. Okay? So that means this is um, uh, iron N2 plus 2 is, is, is more right, active than the N4 structure. Then if you look at cobalt, then cobalt has, you know, requires a higher, you know, over potential compared with ion. And also for hydrogen evolution, it, uh, you know, CO site is uh, maybe favor or hydrogen evolution. Oh, so that matches with the previously this uh, selectivity, right? The Faraday coefficient of C of cobalt is only 45%. So that matches the, the theoretical calculation, you know in here. All right, again, also we did uh, the nickel, and we said nickel is also promising nickel, nitrogen, and carbon. So this work, we also provided single atomic nickel, nitrogen, carbon. We found 96% ferritic efficiency. It's very close to 100%. And then at a relatively you know, low error potential, okay? So the current is uh, here more than 10 million per centimeter square for CO. I think the, the state of art is uh, also around this range. So uh, uh, again, I want to, uh, maybe I forgot to mention that all these uh, activities is characterized in a three electrode uh, system right? with uh, working electrode uh, of the metal carbon, uh, carbon catalyst, uh, Pat platinum as the, the counter electrode and uh, silver silver chloride as the reference electrode. Um, okay, so then again, we after knowing that with this metal and non-metal dopings, then we created uh, an, another it's a co-doping, uh, ion and nitrogen sulfur co-doping all together, and you can see it's further or uh, with the sulfur co-doping, it further increases the ferritic efficiency to ninety-eight percent and at a lower potential of uh, 40.49 uh, volt. And then the, through the theoretical study, we found uh, sulfur doping lowers energy barrier, right? Uh, and enhancing the, the interaction between the iron and these intermediates. Okay, so finally, I think I have maybe three minutes to uh, summarize uh, these uh, three approaches. Again, this, Odin, uh, this table you see is Odin based on my Owen research. I've done on these uh, three approaches. Uh, there are many other uh, approaches, such as uh, photoelectrochemical, PEC, which is also a very, very popular approach. Uh, I haven't worked with, but, but I, uh, so that's why I didn't uh, include that into the comparison. And for electrocatalysis, also there are some high temperature electrocatalysis like using molten salt, which is not that popular, but again, that's the that's, that's approach, I think. Uh, uh, just want you to know this is not an inclusive, uh, right? Just my own, from my own uh, ex uh, experience, uh, what I've done. Okay, so if I, I go through this uh, pros and cons, probably one by one, you can see for photochemical or photocatalysis. In here, I use the gas phase CO2 to react with water vapor, okay? It's not in the aqueous phase for photocatalysis. I want to clarify that. Of course, there's, uh, you know, people use aqueous phase CO2 bubbles through the, the electrolyte. It's more on the PEC approach. But in this, 
uh, photo classes using a gas solid phase. I think the most, uh, the biggest advantage is the, uh, the lower cost, right? In terms of it's very simple. And um, so it just the gas in and out, you get products. Um, so cost uh, is, is low, uh, but the drawback is um, the conversion uh, is also very low. Okay, and stability, as I mentioned, stability is, is also low. Um, because of the low uh, conversion, then you have the separation issue. You have to right, separate a very low concentration of CO from CO2, for example, then that would be costly. In that sense, from the material side or the reactor point of view, it's simple. Okay, so, uh, so then I, 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 I Get, come back to this uh, potential for, for commercialization. I labeled it low to moderate. Um, so for the high temperature approach of photothermal chemical, right, the advantage is that it's high conversion, right, high, high conversion and high selectivity. You get uh, CO or, or, or hydrogen. Of course, that's a thin gas you want, but both of them are at high yield. So and then the minor, there's no other, pretty much no other minor gases produced. Uh, so you don't need to separate them uh, downstream. Okay. Um, but the downside is that the capital investment is high because it's concentrated solar in high temperature, some material cost, right? And also installing, you know, concentrated uh, solar reactor, uh, uh, high cost, and also the solar tracking is an issue because for concentrating solar, you need high uh, solar tracking. So, and also there's a limitation, you can maybe only do that in the Southern right, uh, area, um, but not in the Northern area where you don't have a normal uh, you know, insulation, insulation of sunlight. Um, so that's probably the uh, reason the many industrial you know, industry are not very fond of, you know, investing a lot of money to, to do this, probably because of the high initial cost and or some issue with some uh, long-term maintenance, okay? So I label the commercialization potential to be moderate, okay? And then finally is the, the electrochemical. I said, um, uh, although now the, the conversion, uh, although you see the high selectivity, um, but the conversion uh, actually is relatively low. Uh, of course, with the development of those flow cells, um, then the conversion is higher, so I leave it low to moderate. So hopefully, uh, this uh, efficiency can be increasing you know, in the near future, okay? So, of course, it faces some separation costs as well, um, but the overall investment, I think it, it's low. And uh, so it's it's moderate, it's moderate, but you have to apply uh, PV plus, you know, this electrolyzer, um, but PV price is going down dramatically. So that's why I label uh, the commercial potential is moderate to high. So, okay, to conclude maybe, and you can see also that in recent years, I'm working more on this area, maybe because um, it has a uh, relatively higher potential for commercialization. Okay, so with that, I want to conclude my uh, talk, thanking uh, my uh, students and postdocs, and thanking my collaborators, and uh, most importantly, thank my you know, research sponsors, uh, really many sponsored by National Science Foundation and the ACS uh, Petroleum Research Fund. Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much for attention, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Hello? Dr. Li, you have questions uh, in the chat box. Okay, let me see if we can get that. I have, I have to stop sharing to see that. Is that okay? Uh, you okay. can, yeah, you can. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, that uh, TEA analysis yet. Um, so probably we, we will, we plan to do that in the future, but not, not now. I haven't done that yet. Okay, same questions. Wondering uh, what was CO2 carrier to convert it to CO or other products? 
or other part on the surface from the catalyst. So the first question, okay, the carrier, there's no, um, I don't know which one you're talking about. If the first one, there's no carrier, it's just CO2 itself. It's 100% uh, CO2 to begin with, okay, uh, during this uh, photocatalysis pro process. And then of course you get less than 1% uh, of CO, right? So that's why I say there's a need uh, separation. Um, if you, you if you mean that uh, the the integrity the capture and the uh, conversion process is the first is CO dropping, the second one is using helium as a carry gas to take the CO out. If, if that was the question you were asking, um, so for dry reforming, it's uh, it's a CO two plus methane. That's the reaction gas, right? Then you get CO and hydrogen as reactant uh, as the products. Again, for electrochemical, it's also pure CO2. Uh, and then you bring uh, the CO out from the CO2. So we measure CO from CO2. So did you dissolve CO2 in the liquid or was it flow of CO2? Yeah, it's the flow of CO2 bubble through the electrolyte. Uh, what's the efficiency? I'm not quite I'm sure what that means, uh, the efficiency of what? Um, okay, maybe move on to the next question. Um, do you think of SI or copper? Is that SI? What was it? Uh, chlor chloride catalysis for the thermal generation of hydrogen using neutron neutrons from nuclear. That's 20, 12% of energy mixed in the US. Uh, for soda, did you use? Ion oxide or both? No, uh, the question is, uh, it's, it's a good, good suggestion. I haven't thought about this is neutron, a neutron energy to do that. And um, no, I haven't used these, these ion oxides. Uh, I think people, a lot of people using this uh, iron oxide for chemical looping process, if I remembered. But, uh, but that is a little bit different reaction. Uh, right, you have you, you convert you know metal metal oxide to metal and then regenerate. Um, so that's probably it's another solar solar thermal technology. Actually, also people use cerium oxide to do that too. So, but that's the cycle between the metal and metal oxides. In my case, uh, the dry reforming part is the catalyst stay, stays the same. Right, it's a stable catalyst. So. That's a different approach, but this is a good suggestion. Uh, so next question, TL2 or Lumina as support, any try out on other, this support? I think if you mentioned about the driver forming, but TL2 or Lumina as support, yes, I, I think I briefly mentioned that in my talk, maybe I sp spoke too fast. Uh, we tried Lumina oxide, there's no, it is, the activity is very low, and also the the difference between light and dark is, is very almost no difference. For TL2, we try it out as well as the support. There are a little bit increase of activity under under the light illumination, but not much. Uh, so that's why I think it's a serum. Why serum is good is the the oxygen. All right, the vacancy is you have serum three plus. Um, you form uh, actually three, three, three plus may reduce CO2 right into CO and then you create three and four plus and then the photo illumination could um, the electrons from the photo will reduce four plus back into three plus so to maintain that process to to like, like keep this reaction going so the serum three plus may be the active sites um, so that's my you know hypothesis to explain this and why TL2 is not good. TL2 is not, uh, doesn't have that much oxygen vacancy and mobility. Okay, do you know the next questions? Do you know the reason for the deactivation of uh, magne uh, magnesium lumen TL2 catalyst during the CO2 desorption step, uh, during the CO2 absorption step? Um, I, I think it's because the the low temperature, because you see the first cycle, we have 5% there already. So the 200 degrees C is really not, 
uh, it's probably too low to, to absorb all these uh, carbonated species. So even if you don't shine light on it, I would expect that um, uh, you get Odin 2 parts, right? Desorb CO2 and the residual. So the residual will still increase. Um, even if there's no light you see. In, uh, um, so that, I think the reason is uh, the, the desorption temperature is just too low. Uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, then we now and then we could, uh, you know, regenerate at high temperature and hopefully the, the activity will come back. So I don't know if that uh, addressed this question. Uh, okay, next question. I wonder why copper oxide was not reduced to copper zero. Okay, good, great question. Um, so this one is because we used um, copper two plus to begin with. Uh, and then we used, uh, I think, hydrogen reduction at mild temperature, only 200. And then at, um, I think, uh, atmospheric pressure. Okay. So in that condition, it's, uh, it's very difficult to reduce copper 2 plus into uh, you know, zero valent uh, copper. Um, that's why we also, when the, uh, the XAS study doesn't show any in zero valent copper. Okay. So I think there are researchers, they do you know, very high temperature uh, reduction, right? Um, and then this uh, high pressure, you know, then it might uh, give you the copper zero. But again, it's, uh, all, it's also very challenging to get a pure copper, copper zero. It's always sometimes copper zero and copper one mixture. And that's why the reason when you do XPS, you typically, uh, you cannot distinguish between right, zero and one plus, if I remember right. Um, that, that's another advantage of using uh, XAS uh, from XP, uh, compared to XPS. And also another challenge is when you get your sample out from the reactor, the copper, we see that immediately the copper color changes. That means, right, it can be, the, uh, the reduced species can be oxidized, uh, you know, by air, you know, very quickly. So when you do this ex situ analysis, it's it's not accurate to characterize this copper species. Okay, next question. Uh, concentrated solar rating was used for PDC. Is it necessary? What about UV? Okay, I think the reason we use uh, concentrated solar is because, of course, in real application, you that's the solar is the source, right? To in, to have that high intensity, and then you use concentrated solar. Of course, uh, you can use uh, use a one sun condition without this uh, 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 right one sun, but you cannot reach high temperature using one sun condition. So idea is to at using the solar to power the reaction you know, at high temperature. And then in the meantime, the, the low wavelength UV part can, you know, synergize this, uh, right, the photo and thermal effects together to promote the overall reaction. So, yeah, I mean, you could use, uh, you could use uh, UV or concentrated uh, UV if you have a source of the UV. Um, that's also dual, but in the meantime, you have to heat up the reactor by some other source, right? Or fossil fuel maybe doesn't make much sense, you know, because you uh, produce uh, uh, CO2 uh, as well. So, so again, you know, concentrated solar provide both uh, the energy source. So any strategy to achieve the control over the edge or, or bulk host Yes, we, we have, um, we, I didn't present, one of our paper, recent papers used some uh, uh, itching, right, like hydrogen peroxide uh, to itch the, the surface and to create, uh, create pores. So we found that uh, that's one you know, approach, we can, we can do that. And uh, some, there are other chemical or physical approaches, right, to, to produce the defects on the, on the carbon surface as well. So, so this question is in electrochemical CO2 reduction on metal M4 catalyst, how do you decide optimum pH? Uh, no, we didn't 
Q and the pH, we just used uh, right, uh, uh, 0.1 mole or 0.5 mole potassium uh, bicarbonate. So that's uh, it's near, near neutral pH. In the non-aqueous solvent, well, no, we, we didn't uh, do any non-aqueous solvent. It's just as a, a potassium bicarbonate uh, as the electrolyte. The next question is how about PD onto serum material to get directly, uh, sorry, to get directly to formic acid? Um, no, I haven't thought about it. we. We didn't uh, work with PD and formation of formic acid. I don't know in the, at this high temperature. I wonder if uh, you still get formic acid, right? Because the temperature is above, uh, we showed it's above 600, 6700. So at that that temperature, probably CO, right, is the, the product. Um, so of course, if it's a low temperature, if you operate at a low temperature, then yeah, could be for formic acid formation. Actually, we found, um, also didn't show this, is uh, we did FTIR, in situ FTIR on our catalyst surface. We found the formate as the intermediate at low temperature, right? Let's like say 300 or lower 200. But at too high a temperature, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure because we don't see those peaks uh, very uh, prominently. Uh, but I do, I mean, I agree with you, there's uh, at least we show, we, we see four main species on the surface. That could be uh, intermediate for, for CO. So if there's a way like the, another catalyst to promote, uh, you know, the formic acid pr uh, production, that, that's possible. Okay, next in Quebec, you can reach uh, 6.8, 0.08 cent Canadian dollar per kilowatt hour from green electricity. Yeah, great. Thank you for, for letting us know. That's pretty cheap. Um, it's much uh, cheaper than what we're now paying for, right? Our utility bill, I see, I guess we pay 12 cents US dollars per kilowatt hour. So this is just half of it. That's fantastic. Okay, I guess I've, did I cover all the questions and uh, if there's any other questions you'd like to ask or you could always uh, uh, email me. Um, I'd be happy to, to, you know, answer any questions you may have in the future.